meeting is being recorded. <laughs> and her little sister, Fifi. <laughs> There it is. Yep. I always marvel when everything works. So the Lord is with us. And then we got fireworks. Anytime you think it's going to be a dull Bible study, <laughs> we'll just uh, turn up the microphone and get some World War III happening out there. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's coming soon enough. Don't rush it. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, here we are, Romans chapter four. <clears throat> and we're looking at Abraham. And in particular, we're looking at how Abraham is one of the ways that the law and prophets testify to righteousness from God by faith without reference to law or works. So Paul says that the law and the prophets testify to the righteousness of God being given as a gift, reckoned, without Abraham doing anything. All he did was believe what God said. And God credited his faith as righteousness. And then he makes the point here in verse 10. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And he says, no, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Abraham wouldn't be circumcised until he was 99 years old. And this is way before that. He believed God and God said, you're righteous. Because you're believing what I said, my promise, I count you righteous. And he received the sign later. And it's a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised. So that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. That was verse 11. That's verse 11, yeah. Romans 4. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So we noticed last week that Abraham became the father of nations. That's what God said. He's the father of those who believe who are Gentiles. He's the father of those who believe who are Jews. That's a lot of nations right there. And you know, it's an interesting point here is that those of us who are, are Gentiles are even so related to Abraham by being born again of the Holy Spirit. And even as God is our father, so is Abraham. So, Every once in a while, you run into some believers who really, 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 really wish they were Jewish because then they would be closer to God and they could say, Shalom, and maybe learn Hebrew. But you know, through Jesus, we are sons of Abraham. We're there. You can't get closer than that. So, that's one of the glorious things about being a Christian. We are sons of Abraham and daughters of Abraham. 
So I want to just finish up on verses 11 and 12 here. You notice that that circumcision here is a sign. And that's all it is. You know, that might correspond to baptism today. Baptism is a, a ceremony. And it is a sign. But you know, baptism doesn't do anything in and of itself. I hope everybody knows that. Because, you know, it's, it's just a sign of a reality. Now, circumcision is a sign of righteousness by faith. That's really what it, it, it is. It's a symbol expressing what has happened in the heart. The hard flesh or the unfeeling flesh is cut away, leaving a sensitive and tender heart. All right. Baptism is a symbol of us being buried with Christ, going into the water, and then coming out again in resurrection with Christ. So it's a sign of identification with Christ. And what that is a symbol of is what has actually and really happened in the heart. But if somebody isn't born again, if somebody does not believe in Jesus, hasn't received him, then a person gets baptized and all that happens is they get wet because it is a sign. It's nothing in and of itself. It has no power. And so we have to insist on faith in Jesus. And then if you believe in Jesus, get baptized. He said to do it, but getting baptized without trusting in Jesus. I was talking to a young man one time and he wanted to get baptized. And I said, so you, you really want to follow Jesus? Is that it? He goes, well, yeah, but I still want to get drunk too. And I said, well, then why do you want to get baptized? Because those are two different directions. And you want to get baptized only if you want to follow Jesus with all your heart. But it's not like a rabbit's foot or fire insurance or anything like that. It's just, it doesn't mean anything of itself. What it really points to is the reality in the heart. All right. So, that's why Paul emphasizes this, the faith of the uncircumcised and the faith of the circumcised. Those are the sons of Abraham, the ones who believe the word of God. So, is everybody straight on that? <clears throat> If you have any questions, let me know. But otherwise, we're going to move on. It's, with it's, I like how he clarifies in verse 12 by saying that they also walk in the steps of faith, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you see their belief because it turns into actually following Jesus Okay. with the life. So. Good point. What Joni is saying here is that Faith, really believing God, results in action. And that Abraham's faith was not sort of a head thing, but it affected his life so that he obeyed God with his actions. Mm, yeah. His life and his belief said the same thing. That is... We can say, well, I believe God, and then 
but our lives say, nope, don't believe them at all. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is say the same thing. Yes, yeah. I believe God. And with my life, I believe God. This is a puppet show. <laughs> mm, yeah. So he's exercising his faith through yeah. the way he lives. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. If you believe, then you're going to do, you're going to act on that belief. Yes. Obedience. So now we're going to move on to verse 13. Wow. Progress. <laughs> I think that means I can do it. Four. The promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Oh, I got to do a little something here. I got to change this. I missed a verse here. All right. Let me get a bit bigger. There you go. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> now, he, you know, he, he starts here with that uh, word for, and we have to notice words like this because it's going to help us as we try to understand what the Bible is saying. And can anybody tell us what that word for indicates. A reason or explanation? explanation? Yeah, it's like saying the word because. So that goes back to these statements right here. about that that Abraham was declared righteous by God because of his faith while he was not circumcised. So Paul's going to bring out a point here. The promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law. That is, there was no law. God had not given the law. It wouldn't come until maybe 400 <laughs> years later. So, and there's a point to that. It was not through law, but through the righteousness of faith. That is, by believing what God would do. So Paul's making a contrast here between works because you have to obey the law, right? Mm -hmm. If you obey the law, then you are worthy. You earn your righteousness. Okay, you earn it. But if you're not, if you disobey, you're disqualified. Because you don't meet the qualifications. God should not bless somebody who is a lawbreaker. That, that completely upsets justice. All right. And it's really important that when God promised Abraham, there was no law. That means there's no law for Abraham to break. But instead, he believed God. And God says, that's righteous. So look what his discussion is here. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise nullified. Now, you know, before we get going on that, I just got to emphasize this. Look at that. Heir of the world. Is that not an amazing phrase? Does everybody know what an heir is? Mm -hmm. Even though it has the letter H there before, what does it mean? Someone who's going to inherit something. Somebody who inherits. Hmm. 
I'm going to look up the word. One who receives property from an ancestor. One who is entitled to inherit property. Okay, so Abraham is entitled to inherit property. How much property? World. The whole world. How do you like that? One who receives or is entitled to receive something other than property from a parent or predecessor. Okay, so an heir is somebody designated to receive something. Really, it's kind of like somebody makes up a will and says, I want Rob to receive my rock collection. <laughs> and when that will is read out, all the other relatives stare at Rob, jealous, because they wanted the rock collection. And they were hoping Uncle Fritz would give it to him. But he gave it to Rob. Now, if they could, those jealous relatives would beat Rob up and take the rock collection, but they can't. Because it's a will and it's legal. And so Rob wins. He gets the rock collection and he gets to keep it. All right. So Abraham is the heir of the world. You know, because we're related to Abraham, we share in that promise. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All right. I, I think that's fabulous. I've never owned a house in my life. But I think I'm going to get to own something now. All right. Look at verse 14. For, oh my goodness. Again. There's another one. For, the law brings about wrath. All right. Let's look at this. If those who are of the law are heirs, that means you're working at it. And you have to demonstrate that you're worthy. Faith is made void. And the promise is nullified for the law brings about wrath. All right. Faith is made void. What does the word void mean? Ineffectual. Really? Yes. I feel like we saw that word somewhere earlier in this passage. Of no legal force or effect. Null. Containing nothing. Okay, so faith is nothing if, if you can't do faith and law at the same time. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, either you earn something. Or you receive it as a gift. Yeah. Jinx. So you can't work for something and receive it as a gift. It's one or the other. Did I insult you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> can, I, can I talk now again? Yes, you may. Okay. <laughs> I'll just sit over here by myself. How about? <laughs> so keep talking. You got the floor. No, you jinxed me. I unjinx okay. you. <laughs> Quick trip back to sixth form. That's right. All right. You cannot include faith and law at the same time. You can't depend on God and work for yourself at the same time. Isn't that a revolutionary concept? Isn't it natural for us to want to mix those? But Paul says you can't do that. If you work for your acceptance with God, you may not trust him. 
you're depending on yourself. Mm. Got to write that in red. Come on back, guys. Mm. Okay, that's why, that's what law is. You are depending upon yourself to perform. So no faith and the promise is nullified. Now we got to look up that word nullified because that's going to be important. Oh, to make null. <laughs> I'm having a deja vu all over again. <laughs> Almost the same word. As to make of no value or consequence. Mm -hmm. It is to make it nothing. Worthless. So faith is nothing. The promise is nothing. Yeah. It never gets fulfilled for the law brings about wrath never be with god all right so look you break the law you go to jail you collect no two hundred dollars so the law brings about wrath because i disobey the law and i instead i get wrath So forget the promise, I'm in trouble, and I can't get out, and I could use a savior, but when I'm depending on myself, there is no savior. I have just gotten myself in trouble, but... In contrast, where there is no law, there is also no violation. Isn't that great? Yeah, I don't quite get how that factors into the argument because God gave the law. Correct. So, it, and the law is good. That's right. You know, the answer to all that is in Romans 7, which we will get to. Right. So we're going to hold on to that and thoroughly explore this. But for right now, mm -hmm. remember that Paul said, but now the righteousness of God is revealed apart from law. And, and he, Paul is explaining here that the promise is not through the law, mm -hmm. but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, it is fulfilled by believing God, not by Abraham. If you do these 15 things, then I'll bless you. Mm. That becomes a law. It becomes a condition to be fulfilled. And Abraham disqualifies himself because he broke the conditions. But there's no law in this case. Mm. Right. That there's no condition to be fulfilled. Therefore, there's no violation so he's basically saying the promise was given before the law came in absolutely yeah. okay so that's kind and of in like galatians that. paul says 430 years before the law mm -hmm. so this is centuries before there was a law that could have disqualified abraham but he fulfilled the qualifications for faith. He believed God. So there's no law involved here. No qualification for Abraham to keep. He just believed God's word and there's no violation. Any more questions about this? Because we can look at it and think about it. There's no rush here. I got a cup of coffee here. Yeah. All right, moving along. For this reason, it is by faith 
that is the promise in order that it, the promise, may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. All right, let's, let's look at verse 16. For this reason, Because you can't mix law and faith. Oh, is there a is problem? That what you wrote? Um, That's what I wrote. Okay, because you can't mix law and faith. Okay. So can I just ask a question? So does that mean that Abraham didn't need to repent in that sense because he wasn't under the, you know, the law wasn't there? Do you know what I'm trying to yeah. get my head around? Yeah. Do you know... Well, here's an interesting thing. Abraham made some mistakes. Yeah. And he even disobeyed sometimes. But he believed God. It didn't disqualify him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a different basis than law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Just the relationship. Now, that's something Abraham had, was relationship with God. And he kept that. And everything that God told him to do, he did. Mm. Go sacrifice your son. Yeah. He did it. Now, you know, he developed that over decades of living with God, worshiping God. We're going to see some of that even tonight. But he had this relationship with God. He engaged with God. Yeah. So that's why it even says of Abraham, he was the friend of God. Mm. He hung with God. Did I answer your question, Fiona? Yeah, yeah, I think you did. Yeah, yeah, I did. You know... We all have to repent. Everybody repents. It's only the ungodly who don't repent. Did you know that? The godly people are repenting all the time. Yeah. That's one of the reasons or one of the ways you know you're godly is mm -hmm. you're just going, oh, I did that wrong. Oh, I did that wrong. Godly, ungodly people always say, look, you have a problem, not me. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. But we're always coming to Jesus, and he's always making us right. That's godly. That's what has to happen. Okay. For this reason, it is by faith that is depending on God. In order that it may be in accordance with grace. All right. Grace. Let's look at grace. This is really important. Look at this. A favor done without expectation of return. The absolutely free expression of the loving kindness of God to men. Finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver. God doesn't bless because we're good. He blesses because he's good. Now, if you were to bless on the basis of my good, that fluctuates. Sometimes I'm not so good. Sometimes I'm good. I'm, I'm very changeable. 
But because it's because God is good, his goodness never changes. And so the basis of our blessing never changes and we can relax because it's because of God's goodness, his grace, his unmerited favor. Now you think about that for a second. The law brings about wrath. That's what you deserve. That's what you merit. We merit destruction. We don't deserve mercy, but that's when you need it the most. God gives according to grace, his goodness. Not my deserving. So that the promise will be guaranteed. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Guaranteed. Let's look up that word guaranteed because the Greek is stable or steadfast. All right. Assured with a guarantee. Okay, we still got to look up the word guarantee. An assurance for the fulfillment of a condition. Ooh, I love that. Mm. If God fulfills the conditions, then they're going to be fulfilled perfectly. Mm. Now, I don't have to worry. Do you think God missed a detail? Mm. Do you think he forgot about something? Do you think he did something inadequate? So that I'll find out at the last minute. Oops, didn't do enough. Gee, uh, you're not going to make it. That's a bad time to find out you're not going to make it. Right in front of the judgment seat of God. That's not good. So... This is an agreement by which one person undertakes to secure another in the possession or enjoyment of something. One person undertakes to secure another. Jesus says, I am your guarantee that you will possess eternal life and the righteousness of God. You will never lose these things because I am your guarantee. How do you like that? In fact, I'm going to find that in Hebrews. Chapter 9. Verse 15. You think? Uh, is that 9.15? Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. Ah, uh, there's a, there's, there's the mediator, and that's true. I mean, that, that is an effect what Jesus does. He becomes the guarantee that those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Inheritance. But Well, you know what? I'm going to have to break down and actually search. Here it is. And it's, I'm so sorry. It was in chapter seven. 
so much more also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Okay, so you got it there, right there in scripture, Hebrews 7, verse 22. And the context for this is that he became a priest with an oath. So the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And so that means that Jesus is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he is the guarantee of this better covenant. He has undertaken to secure me in the possession and enjoyment of my salvation. I cannot lose this because he is my guarantee. It's not on my performance, it's on his performance. And if he performs perfectly, then I'm guaranteed. All right. So I'm just going to mark this briefly that this guarantee Hebrews 7.23 so it's guaranteed to all the descendants not only to those who are of the law, which are the Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. So if you believe what God has said about Jesus, the promise is guaranteed to you because that's what it says. Guaranteed. Some other person has undertaken to secure for you the possession and enjoyment of eternal life. Okay, he's the father of us all. That's crazy. As it is written, a father of many nations, have I made you? Now, if you notice here, this is the fulfillment of the promise. Mm -hmm. You believe in Jesus. You are the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. I have made you a father of many nations. You're a German. Abraham is your father. You're a Brit. Abraham is your father. You're an American. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. You poor, poor American. Well, my father is Abraham and God. Top that. Now, Abraham is the father of us all in the presence of him who, whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. That's a great way to think about God, isn't it? God gives life to the dead. He resurrects them and he calls into being that which does not exist. So he called Abraham a father of many nations. Did that exist when God said it to him? So God, he says stuff hundreds of years, thousands of years. But when he says it, 
it has to happen. It's that Isaiah 55, right? Where God says, you know, my word, it goes out of my mouth and it does that which I send it to do. And it doesn't ever come back to me void. So see, here's a word of God that he spoke. I have made you a father of many nations. And you know, God only speaks the truth. But it wasn't true yet. But you know, when God says it, it is true and it must happen. So if he says, hey, you're going to have a son. And Abraham goes, but I'm 99. God says, you know what? Not a problem. Don't laugh. <laughs> I'm going to live. I'm going to give you life. And I've made you the father of many nations. This is when he said to Abraham when he was 99 years old. So, those were two things that Abraham had to believe God for. Abraham believed God that he gives life to the dead, and he calls into being that which does not exist. This is creation out of nothing. And Abraham was dead when God affirmed that promise. So we have this phrase in verse 18, in hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Mm -hmm. Now, a great definition of faith isn't it all right he says in hope against hope mm -hmm. how are we to believe this well hope means to expect what was promised That you don't see. Because later on in chapter 8, Paul will say, in hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he already sees? But if we hope... For what we do not see, with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. So God spoke this word, and he couldn't see it. Gives life to the dead. Well, I don't see that. And he calls into being that which does not exist. I've made you a father of many nations. All right. He believed before he saw it. Did you know that seeing is not believing? Believing is believing. Well, and there's a, a natural expectation, and then there's an expectation because God taught you to expect something or All right. promised you something. All right. Here. I always took it to be like the against hope was like considering his own body, you know, as good as dead. 99 years old kind of the we can consider the second hope this hope here as human expectation mm -hmm. what hope does a 99 year old guy have is he going to have kids nope but here's the thing God says yes you're going to have kids so 
Abraham expected what God promised. And that was against all human expectation. Mm -hmm. Believe God. That's really important. You just don't believe in belief. You have faith in your faith. Just if you believe hard enough, it'll happen. Come on. That's not faith. Faith is your dependence on what God has said. And if God hasn't said something, you can believe all you want. But God isn't going to do it because he didn't promise that. So this is why we look for the promises in scripture. And then we bring them to God and say, you know what? You promised. We cannot twist God's arm to make him do what we want. But we can call him on his word. That's why he said it. So that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be now. A father of many nations I have made you. That's when he's 99. But this so shall your descendants be. That was spoken at the very beginning. Let me show you. you go to Genesis 15. This is when the promise was made. And there's the promise right there in verse 5. So shall your descendants be. And then, I believe it's in chapter 19. Uh oh It's 18. All right. It's 20. Sorry, guys. All right. It's in 17. Because he says, For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. This is when Abraham was 99. Mm -hmm. So when Abram was 99 years old, God repeated his promise and he says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, exalted father, but your name shall be called Abraham, father of a multitude. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. It's not I will, it's I have. I have already done this things that don't exist it didn't exist mm -hmm. but if god says it exists then it exists it's real no, don't it. all right hmm. so look at verse 19 without becoming weak in faith he contemplated his own body now good is dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he says, yes, there are a few problems here. My body's dead, so Sarah. We can't have kids, humanly speaking. It's impossible. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, mm. but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, mm. he was able also to perform. Mm. So mm. he didn't become weak in faith. Mm. All right. That's one thing he didn't do, but he did look at his own body so he didn't ignore it. He didn't become weak in faith. He didn't ignore the problems.
Okay. He didn't like practice some kind of mind over matter, mind over matter. Kind of like, you know, some people are worried about the things that come out of their mouth and they cannot confess like I'm sick because you're never supposed to confess the negative. You're always supposed to confess, oh, I'm healthy. <gasps> and I'm wealthy. And you never confess, oh, I wish I had some money. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. Abraham confessed the positive. My body is as good as dead. Hmm. And Sarah's not doing so good either. <laughs> We're both pretty much at the end of things. We're pretty dead here. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, you know what he did? He thanked God for his son. He said, well, you're going to have to do this. So thank you for the son. Thank you that you have made me a father of many nations. Thank you. He hadn't received it yet, but he says, hey, it's as good as done. Thank you. And that's what he did. In fact, he made like he already received it. He says, I have a son. Now, that's not, again, imagining something. God said it. Therefore, he could say, thank you, God, for my son. And you know, when Sarah got pregnant, it wasn't a girl they were expecting. <laughs> or twins. It had to be a son because God said so. So Sarah gets pregnant and Abraham goes, it's a boy. And they say, well, how do you know? You don't know, but he says, no, it's a son. I even know his name. We're calling him laughter because that's what God said to call him. So it's not a girl and it's not twins. It is a son and I'm thanking God for him. He was fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform because it's God. And he gives life to the dead and he calls into being that which does not exist. So if God says something, then he can do it. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. It was all contained in that. He says, okay, that's your promise. That's it. And I believe you. Now, so shall your descendants be is probably 20, 25 years before a father of many nations I have made you? But God credited to him right then, before anything happened, as righteousness. Now, here's the punchline to everything that Abraham is saying. Now, not for his sake only, was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Does God raise people from the dead? Of course he did. Because he raised Abraham before he raised Jesus. Does everybody get that? Abraham was as good as dead, and God enabled him to give life to the son of promise. And so we believe in him who
who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over for our transgressions. That's death. And he was raised because of our justification. That's resurrection. And that's the gospel. Right there. He was delivered over as a substitution for our sins. And he paid for them all. And he was raised because he made us righteous. Imagine if he had not paid for one sin. Almost sufficient. He would have stayed dead. He would not have been raised. So the resurrection of Jesus proves that his sacrifice is effective forever. Mm -hmm. And we are justified, declared righteous in the same way as Abraham because we believe what God says. That Jesus' sacrifice completely redeems us from our sins, buys us out, makes sin a thing of the past. And we are freed from our sins and from our punishment, from our condemnation. We're completely out of that because Jesus died for our sins and he rose from the dead. That is our guarantee that when we believe in him, we are made perfect. We're given the righteousness of God as a gift. So just in the same way as Abraham, we believe God. We believe what he says. And it's not what we do, it's what he does. And we say, yep, you do it. Mm. God says, okay, you're righteous now. Mm. Think about your account now. It is credited with full and complete divine righteousness of God as a gift. Mm. Don't feel guilty. Don't be afraid. Don't expect the worst when you stand before God. Because he's going to receive you as a son and a daughter. He says, come here. I'm going to give you a divine hug. And it's going to be glorious. So that's why we read our Bibles. Because mm. we want to know what God has said so that we can trust him. Just this morning, I'm meditating in Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. He doesn't have to change it. And it will last forever. It will outlast the heavens and the earth. Mm. And this word right here is settled forever in heaven. The one who believes in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead is justified, declared righteous, receives eternal life, and Jesus is the guarantee. We cannot lose this. Mm. So awesome. I leave it at that. But think about it during the week and you're going to get happy. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about this? You get to feel happy. You get to have joy. You can't live without it. And this is really the key to joy if you think about it. So if you're not happy, then you need to catch up. 
and think about this and realize here's here's our righteousness right here. You can work it out in your mind and say, yes, it's not vague. It's not a feeling. Mm -hmm. It is truth. Because it's true, I can rest in that. Because God said it. Fully convinced. I think it's thank God right now. Yes. I think it's always a temptation to to do something good and um, to get on this track. Hey, look, I'm I'm good. I'm doing good, and it's so um, it's so strong. The verse that um, if if I fall back into works, that it nullifies 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 my faith. So. Um, this big contrast and this this danger to get back on old habits, mm. and so it's so important to have this in the mind and in the heart. Mm. Um, what you just said, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm hitting it hard. Yeah, <laughs> this is this mm. is so good, mm. and you realize, you know. God really wants to save me. And it's bigger than me or you. This is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. Mm. So I'm part of that. Yeah. So if I don't make it, then part of God's promise to Abraham gets unfulfilled. Isn't that crazy? So... There's a lot going on here. Mm -hmm. And you know, then what we get to do is just like Abraham, we get to give glory to God. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not redeemed yet. Our bodies are still as good as dead. And we have to just take that on board. You know, my eyesight isn't getting so good and I got an ache here and something here and the stitches are kind of coming loose. We think, wow, I'm as good as dead. But then we say, well, Jesus died for my sins and he rose again from the dead. And I believe him and he took all my sins away. He said, it is finished. And so I can give glory to God. I can say, thank you, God, that all of my sins were placed on Jesus. Mm -hmm. An old Jesus movement song called Clean Before My Lord I Stand. And in, he, in me, not one blemish does he see. That's an amazing thing. Yeah. It's really profound that Abraham was completely incompetent to make that promise happen himself because we're unable, we're completely incompetent to make our bring ourselves to heaven as well. And it's okay to admit that. Yeah. And so he saw his body as good as dead. And he says, guess what? My body is as good as dead. I'm not going to be the one to make this happen. Yep. It has to be the divine power of God, which is the same thing for our righteousness. <laughs> you know? Yep. It has to that's, be. So, that's so liberating, isn't it? Just, Absolutely. you know, because you, the pressure's off us. <laughs> yes, exactly. Which and you know what the Lord wants it to be. And what an understatement, right? That what yeah. God had promised, he was also able to perform. <laughs> He's mm -hmm. beyond able to perform everything for us. Yes. You know, to, and and what, a, what an understatement. And how I sometimes think, well, can God really save me? You know, I'm just such a loser Christian yeah. or whatever. But yeah. that's kind of, again, looking at myself. 
rather than glorifying God and saying, you said you're going to save me by faith in Jesus. So yeah. you're able to save me and giving him glory rather than looking at myself. And remember, it is it is like looking at the bronze serpent on a pole. Mm -hmm. And it's looking at Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if we start to get feeling a little anxious, it's because we're looking at ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is no place to look. <laughs> when we look away from ourselves, that is the very idea of humility. That we're no longer looking for things out of ourselves, but we're looking away out of ourselves to Jesus. Expecting from God and not ourselves, expecting from him. So that's what we're doing. Mm. We want to see Jesus mm. and we can see him and say, that is the fulfillment of all of my sin and all of my punishment was laid upon him. And it's finished. I, I um, think the three verses are like a little guideline. So first, um, look to God, who's the giver of life to the dead and calls things into existence. So the powerful, mighty God, and don't look to the circumstances like my, my body is dead. There's no way. So if I look to the powerful, mighty God, there is the hope that I can find the hope and the belief I need, the faith I need. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, because the circumstances are always, of our lives are always threaten, threatening to overshadow our vision of him and his goodness and his power to, to save us and help us. Yeah. Now I want to, I want to point something else out here. Now notice that it was written for our sake. You think, well, now that was only talking to Abraham. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the things about scripture is that it is written for our sake. Mm -hmm. Everything is written for our sake. And so when it was credited to him for righteousness, that was written for us too. Mm -hmm. So this is for you. Don't say, well, okay, it's, it's good for giant famous men of faith like Abraham. It's also for us. And that's why we read the Old Testament. It's still live and kicking. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Let's pray. Thank you again, Heavenly Father, for this good news that we can even acknowledge our failures and weaknesses and sins and inability, everything that should disqualify us from you blessing us. And yet, when we trust in Jesus, you qualify us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You qualify us because Jesus took away our sins and he rose from the dead. And so we believe you tonight and we trust in you. Your word says that to those that received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God. And we receive you. And we keep on receiving you. And we say, Lord, dwell in us. Be at home in us. We're so glad. We're so thankful. Thank you right now for your gift of righteousness. 
Thank you that you receive us right now. Thank you that today is the day of salvation. Right now, we praise you and bless you for that. Thank you for perfect righteousness. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us. We commit ourselves to you. And we thank you for that guarantee. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, John.